welcome to the Michigan Man Podcast on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew for Wolverine fans from coast to coast. Go Blue and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. My guest today is the editor of what many of us refer to as our Michigan Football Bible. John Borton from the Wolverine Magazine will join us in just a minute on our game day segment for this week. First, a few of my thoughts to get us started. We are now in week three of camp. Jim Harbaugh and staff should have a two deep in place later this week if they don't already. And next week, they'll switch from camp mode to game prep mode for the opener with Middle Tennessee State. On Monday, our captains for the year were announced. The players voted over the weekend and three seniors were chosen. Ben Bredesen, Kalik Hudson, and Carlo Kemp will serve as tri-captains for this upcoming season. My guest today says he thinks Shea Patterson is going to have a big year, that this could be our best offensive line in more than a decade, and Don Brown's defense will once again be very good despite all of the players that we've lost. He thinks there are some concerns, especially in the secondary, but overall, the pieces are there for what could be a very special season, and we all hope so. John Borton from the Wolverine Magazine is up next on our game day segment here on The Michigan Man in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brook. Here with us on our game day segment this week is uh, editor John Borton from the Wolverine magazine. As always, John, it's a pleasure to have you on with us. Well, Mike's great to be with you. I always enjoy it, and uh, especially at this time of year because there is so much excitement and interest in the football season. And uh, as we were just discussing before jumping on, it is absolutely here. What absolutely is, uh, although the first few weeks of training camp, John, are usually fairly quiet from a news perspective. I don't think they're in the submarine that uh, Coach Harbaugh had them in a couple of years ago. But last week, really, the the major news story was the uh, James Hudson situation. It was a big story, both locally and nationally. Everyone jumped on it. What are your thoughts on that whole situation? It just doesn't seem to be going away right now. You know, honestly, my thoughts on it uh, involve the fact that a little overblown in my mind and uh, it, it's the kind of story that that makes you want the season to arrive i think it can be reduced to to this a uh, a buckeye did not get his way regarding a player he saw a chance to uh you know take a shot at uh, michigan and its program and did so i you know i honestly think that because uh, Jim Harbaugh came out and talked about the fact that you know he can't and is not going to embellish uh, the situation so that uh, a player that is transferring can get a hardship waiver. And it very much sounds like that's what Luke Fickle wanted him to do. And, you know, I, I just don't, I don't think that uh, it is that big a deal. Most of the players that transfer don't get a hardship. Shea Patterson got one because uh, the school that he was attending happened to be cheating with the NCAA and had promised him in recruiting, no, no, it'll be fine. Everything, you know, come here. We're going to be fine. And they weren't fine. And so, you know, you're, you're, that was a, a definite justification for him to be able to come here. This is a different deal. I mean, this was just a, this was pretty much of a straight transfer. The young man didn't like the position that he got moved to and wasn't happy for whatever reason, wanted to transfer it. Great. Best of luck to you to try and turn it into a situation where Michigan should have whatever gone mm-hmm. beyond the facts of the case in you know helping him to be eligible for this Paul Harbaugh made it very clear that he's not going to do that I don't think he should 
In other news uh, from last week, we uh, we always watch that injury front, uh, you know, during camp, hoping nothing major is going to happen. But the Andrew Stuber injury popped up. Uh, really the first one of camp that we know about. Do we know yet the uh, severity of that injury and, you know, how long he's going to be out? We don't know for sure, uh, but it's, it's certainly significant enough that he's going to miss the first part of the season. That was indicated. I'm, I'm thinking it may be a, a longer term uh, type of situation, but we'll wait and see. I, I just, um, when you have a, uh, an injury that's in camp that, that you're ruled out for at least, you know, a portion of the season, you know, that uh, something significant has taken place and, you know, opens this door certainly for Jalen Mayfield, who was uh, the, the redshirt freshman who was battling in there anyway, but it certainly does uh, cut down your, your depth and you feel terrible for, for a kid like Stuber who had uh, gotten into some games at the end of last year. And you think about all the work that these guys do once that season's over right into winter conditioning and into right. spring ball and they work so hard in the summer and then to see it all taken away from you, it's, uh, you know, I think a Tariq Black as a receiver had that taken away from him two straight years. And it is very tough, but it's one of the, the lessons and the, one of the things that you have to go through as a football player. You know it's possible, but you sure never want to see it happen. As far as we know, Jalen Mayfield will win that starting tackle job. It was a toss-up anyway with he and uh, Stuber. They were battling uh, for that job. So, as you mentioned, depth probably a concern right now, but the starting group, the starting group we think we're going to see uh, come the opener should be the best we've seen at Michigan in, in quite a while, John, shouldn't it? It has a chance to be their best line in more than a decade, really, since uh, uh, back to the Lloyd Carr days, quite honestly. I mean, you just uh, – offensive line for Michigan was such a um, – just a rock solid annually and knew it was going to be great. Those lines under Jerry Hanlon for all those years. And, and then uh, even after that, through, uh, through the nineties, when you had the Everett's and the Cucuzos and, and the great, great players that uh, were up there getting the job done in front. And quite frankly, you know, the, that line has underperformed for a good long while started to turn around last year with uh, Ed Warner as the coach at that position. He has got a bunch of guys that uh, were fairly well decorated, starting with John Runyon Jr. as a uh, as a first team All Big Ten guy, and there, and you know a couple of second teamers in there, a third teamer, and now you've got a year under your belt with Warner. Uh, that coach has already expressed the fact that he loves working in uh, a, a spread system, and that's what he's more accustomed to. So you, the, the natural projection would be, okay, you're going to take that step forward, but now they got to do it. As we've just mentioned, people are worried about the depth in that offensive line and have been for a decade or more. I think the difference this time, and Coach Warner has uh, spoken to this, is there's there's plenty of talent at the two spots in that offensive line. And he, as he said, the only thing they lack is experience, but they're very talented. Oh, yeah. The the freshman class that they have brought in is, uh, is really good. You've got guys talking about a number of players from that class already. And, uh, you know, they're ready to make some shifts around. They've had some – they've got some other guys that have been around now for a few years and – um, can do some things. I was talking about those freshmen. You got Carson Barnhart and Trent A. Jones and and uh, several. Nolan Rumler uh, is um, a kid that uh, has been impressive so far. Just behind the scenes, Zach Carpenter. There's just a lot of guys, but there are also some veterans. As I mentioned, uh, Joel Honingford is one that uh, is very versatile you've got uh, Chuck Filiaga on the inside and he's been around we've heard a lot about him Steven Spinellis uh, we've heard about him challenging for a couple of years now mm-hmm. on the offensive mm-hmm. line so it, it's you're right your point is well taken that they've got guys 
that uh, not only that they're grooming for next year and the years to come, but uh, that have been around and could very well plug in uh, once once you need them. I didn't even mention Ryan Hayes, who is uh, a redshirt freshman and has been very impressive and probably would be next man in if something happened to uh, to anybody else up there, especially at the tackle spots. Well, other news last week that was clarified was Ambry Thomas. I think since spring we've been wondering what's wrong with uh, with Ambry. Uh, there was really nothing said about his condition, but now we know it's colitis. And it's, you know, it's like I tell anyone, if you've known anyone that suffers from that, athlete or not, it is serious business. Coming back from colitis is different for everyone as far as a timetable for recovery. And we could sure use Ambry, but it could be a long ordeal for him, John, couldn't it? I certainly think so. I mean, and you just look at the way it's laid out when, when Harbaugh was talking about him. It's not just that you have to uh, get over and get past the colitis flare-up. It, uh, you have to then regain the weight that you've lost, and that's a natural occurrence with that sort of thing. Yeah. You, you have lost weight. You have to get that back. Then you've got to get conditioning back, and then you have to – I mean – Quite frankly, you've got to be prepared for having him out for most or all of the season. Mm-hmm. That's not any guarantee that it's going to happen that way, and maybe he comes back before that. But uh, they're in a situation where, you know, it's it's go time, and uh, it's just it's obviously going to be a while. I thought one of the more interesting stories coming out of camp last week, though, John, was regarding Ben Mason's uh, progress on the defensive line. They're saying he's 275 pounds. Doesn't look like he has an ounce of fat on him, John. And from what his teammates uh, are saying, he is the same kind of nasty on that side of the ball, too, isn't he? Oh, he's got the perfect uh, mental makeup for <laughs> a, a defender. Uh, he is attacking all the time. He's physical. He's uh, he's extremely motivated. And I'll be very interested to see what he adds to that now i mean i think uh, john runyon the other day said you know he's got to got to learn to handle a double team because he's going to have uh 600 pounds coming at him plus at times over on that defensive line i think that he with his attitude he will come along and uh, and do a great job um he certainly provides depth to that defensive line. And the bigger point there is this is uh, we were talking not all that long ago about a defensive line that really needed depth and might uh, be scary in that aspect. But I don't, I just don't see it. I think uh, in Aiden Hutchinson and Quiddy pay, you've got uh, very, very strong defensive ends. You we've seen guys coming up that uh, are going to be able to do the job in the middle and uh, I, I just think that uh, the defensive line, the defensive front, the front seven is going to be, in my mind, better than advertised or better than projected throughout the winter. And uh, at the same time, the, my big worry on the defense would be the, that back, uh, back four, that secondary at this point. Well, I know I'm sort of bouncing around right now because we uh, two weeks into camp, we don't have a lot of specifics to talk about, really, until the uh, the season starts. But there's a lot of uh, news and interesting stories surrounding training camp and the schedule. I thought one of the, uh, the interesting ones last week, again, was uh, Jerry Palm from CBS Sports. He says Michigan has the toughest Big Ten non-conference schedule and probably the second toughest schedule overall after South Carolina, and theirs is brutal. And it really is hard to argue with that, isn't it, John? Oh, yeah. I mean, Notre Dame was a playoff team last year. Notre Dame has plenty back. And you're taking Notre Dame and wedging it into the middle of a Big Ten schedule. Mm -hmm. You will be facing the Irish right after they've had a bye week and right after Michigan has been asked to survive. uh, And it's always a very tough venue at Penn State. So you you do that, and uh, if somehow Michigan gets past that fortnight at two and zero, then it goes to Maryland the very next week, and that if there's ever been a trap game, uh, that would be it because you not only have survived what I just said, uh, the week after that Michigan State. Uh, it, it's a it's a real gauntlet in the back half of this season for Michigan. 
yes, the, the upside is you've got Notre Dame, you've got Michigan State, you've got Ohio State, all at Michigan Stadium. But the fact of the matter is you have to play them, and there are certainly landmines all over, even in the first half of the schedule, going to Camp Randall with Wisconsin and having to face Iowa at home. It's just it's uh, it's going to be a real test, but I think Michigan's more prepared to take on a tough schedule than, again, at any time in the last decade. And last week, Ward Manuel was asked about uh, the second night game, and he mentioned it's not going to be Michigan State. So you would think, add that on to uh, the fact you're playing Notre Dame in October. I'm getting the feeling it's a night game, too. Yeah, I think it will be. That's uh, That's all indications are that that would be the one that that makes sense and uh certainly Michigan has had uh great success playing Notre Dame at home at night and uh it's a special deal so i i would expect that that would be the case at the same time uh, hearing that uh there's a chance that Penn State might not be a night mm. game. So who knows yeah. uh, how this thing's going to shake out. With us here in our game day segment this week as we continue to get ready for the fast approaching upcoming season is editor John Borton from the Wolverine magazine. Well, John, a week from this Saturday, we finally start getting some answers about Michigan football uh, when we open at night with Middle Tennessee State. I'm still surprised that's a night game, but it should be a great environment to get the season underway, shouldn't it? It should. And I think there are a couple things that argue in favor of it being a night game if you're going to have a couple of night games mixed in there for one it's on august 31st and uh, as we all know august uh or even september in michigan stadium can be very 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 hot and so to put that game at night uh you uh it will at least be a little bit cooled down by then and uh I, yeah, I, I think that you're going to find out a lot in a hurry. One of the things that we haven't talked about uh, is simply the fact that uh, this entire new offensive system is going to be under great scrutiny. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've had Josh Gaddis that was working without a lot of the crew that he's going to be counting on in uh, in the spring because he was uh, they just had so many guys out. And now all of a sudden, to me, the biggest news of fall camp was the number of people that you had back and that uh, now he's got all these uh, guys at his disposal. Yes, Donovan Peoples-Jones uh, sounds like he's still a little slowed, but to have Tariq Black and to have Nico Collins and Ronnie Bell that has been tearing it up and a couple of these freshmen, Cornelius Johnson and uh, and Mike uh, Sandstrill, I, I just, this is going to be one, uh, if it stays healthy, it is going to be an amazing uh, wide receiving core, and to see how Gaddis applies what uh, he wants to do and what he's able to do with it, it's, that's going to be, the, to me, that's going to be the story of these early games, seeing that develop. Oh, absolutely. And uh, since he hired on, everyone wants to see the Josh Gaddis speed and space offense, so he won't have to wait long now. But we also know that Shea Patterson is going to be the uh, straw that stirs the drink in, in that speed and space offense, uh, which seems to be perfectly tailored uh, to his talents. But he has to be the man this year uh, under center and have a huge season for Michigan, doesn't he? Yeah, I think he does need to be, and I think he will. That's the thing. I've been predicting uh, a 3,000-yard season throwing for uh, for Shea Patterson. He threw for, what, 2,600? Mm-hmm last year and kept the turnovers down. I, I really think that uh, he'll go for uh, more than three bills this year with that uh, cast of characters he's got at the wide receiver. You know, he's got the tools. He can run. He can uh, he can throw on the run either way. He, he just is a very, very good fit for, uh, for what Josh Gaddis would like to do. And I think, you know, I can see him having a, a, a huge season. Um, even a, a first-team All Big Ten season uh, for starters, he was recently rated the highest-rated uh, quarterback in the Big Ten mm-hmm. coming in, and this is a this is a big thing though. Uh, as we know, injuries can happen. 
injuries can happen, uh, particularly when you're exposing your quarterback somewhat in an RPO. Right. So if he goes out for a quarter, for a game, whatever, uh, the fact that Michigan is in better shape right now quarterback-wise than it has been since maybe the days of, of Tom Brady and Drew Ensign, uh, I think says a lot. And with Dylan McCaffrey coming on and Jim Harbaugh said he's going to play a lot, Gaddis said he'll certainly uh, mix quarterbacks in there at times, I, I think that's huge because you, you're, you can't be one play away from uh, being handcuffed for your offense because your quarterback, your backup quarterback, can't get the job done. McCaffrey clearly can, and I think that's uh, that's going to – not only has it pushed Shea Patterson to continue to work on his game and, and make sure that he is doing all the right things, it just uh, – it counts way up there for Michigan if something happens. If – you have any concerns about this Michigan offense right now? And, of course, we haven't seen them yet, but what would they be, John? Well, the biggest thing is, do you have uh, somebody that can really get it done as a running back? And I think they have all the uh, pieces in place to compete for it. I think True Wilson is somebody that they can count on as, as somebody who is steady, that is going to give you the pass blocking that you need in those third down situations and that uh, he showed he can run a little bit last year. The other guys, Christian Turner, we saw flashes in the uh, bowl game and late in the season. We're hearing great things about Zach Charbonnet, the true freshman coming on like a freight train as uh, Jim Harbaugh himself said, but we haven't seen it on the field. Mm -hmm. And I have to, I always have to, when I, when I start talking about the running back position, I always think of my good friend Jerry Hanlon, who formed all those uh, great offensive lines for Michigan through the years, <laughs> giving me a, a look of, of semi-disgust and saying, you show me a great line and I'll show you great running backs. So yeah. I, I think that, uh, yes, Michigan's going to have the line in place to have uh, the, the backs be successful. Now somebody has to step up, take it, prove that they can uh, be durable and uh, and not put the ball on the turf. Well, over on the other side of the ball, if Don Brown is even a wee bit worried about his defense, you'd never know it by listening to him. Uh, he seems to think this might be the fastest group of defensive players he's ever coached, and that is saying a lot, isn't it, John? Uh, very much so, because uh, I remember him saying that uh, just a couple years ago. And if uh, <laughs> if this group is anything like uh, the 2016 group uh, who was cited as as being very good and then lived up to it, you know, you, it, it'll be exciting to see. People will look at this and say, oh, my word, you've lost Devin Bush, you've lost Chase Winovich, you've lost Rashawn Gary, and, and, and look at it from that standpoint. But you also have to look at the fact that Don Brown has uh, more talent now on this field than he had certainly at Boston College when he made Boston College the number one defense in the nation. He's done it before. He'll do it again. I think that he's got a lot of pieces here. My concern, as I mentioned before, is in the secondary and mm -hmm. making sure that Michigan has the uh, – the, uh, cornerbacks in particular to step up. They've got one all Big Ten corner in Lavert Hill, uh, but you know who who is it on the other side, and can they uh, step into that role and do the things that they need to do? And what about depth? What if somebody goes down? I think they've got uh, some some really good strength at safety. I think uh, that uh, Josh Metalus and uh, and Brad Hawkins will probably be your starters there at first, and uh, Jamaric Woods, and you've got some depth there. You've got some guys that have been around. Cornerback, I have concerns about, and I think, like I said, the front seven is going to be very, very good. Well, no question. There's a, a ton of talent to work with on that defense, and it would be nice if this unit was as good as last year's, but 
if the offense is as good as we think it might be, even close to last year, should be more than enough for this defense. Yeah, and the mesh will be interesting as well because we've had so many years uh, before and after Rich Rodriguez <laughs> where it, it was all about protecting the defense. So what's the best defense when they're sitting on the sideline because you're going to grind and take time off the clock and you want to – Oh you know, yes, you you're gonna you want to score, but you want to uh, beat the the opposing defense up while you do it, and and uh, rest your defense. And this is doesn't sound like the approach now. You're not going to be as protected. And Don Brown, he will clearly tell you, look, we've got to watch out for ourselves. We don't need anybody protecting us. But I a scenario was presented to me that rang fairly true and I'd like to keep a real close eye on you know Army gets uh, gets the ball early in that game and uh, and does its option wizardry until you know before Michigan has adjusted to it and takes it down 10 or 12 plays and taking time off the clock and and uh, eventually is forced to kick a field goal and then Michigan's offense goes out there and, and you know attacks but goes three and out and it's right back in Army's hands. Those are the kinds of things that I I look at and think, okay, how's this going to work, and how's it? How are they going to adjust to it and step up to it? So, I think there's some very exciting things on both sides of the ball, but there are also some things that. that you're going to have to see how the mesh is. Well, another facet of the game we don't spend a lot of time in the preseason talking about are the special teams. Uh, we do know that competition is ongoing at both the field goal and punting positions. We're in good shape from a talent perspective there, so I don't think we're real concerned. If there is a special team concern right now, it might be in the return game because Ambry Thomas was a big part of that, or we thought he would be. So Donovan Peoples-Jones, I think, is going to be handling the punt returns, but that piece of the uh, the, spe- the uh, special teams might be a, a wee bit concerning right now. I think it could be different, but I think it could be you might have uh, the kind of speed and talent there that uh, could really catch your eye as well. It, Giles Jackson is a kid that has come in and... Uh, Mike, like Mike Sandstrill, is very quick, very fast, very explosive. I think those two guys might get a, a crack at that uh, return spot. And I'm not so sure that uh, obviously they have to do it in a game. Mm-hmm. And Ambry Thomas certainly did. But it's not like you lose uh, an Ambry Thomas and then all of a sudden you're, you're, you're going with the plow horse back there. You're not. <laughs> well, last question for you, John. It's. Uh... As we know, it's year five of the Jim Harbaugh era, and it has been a very good run. Uh, three ten win seasons, but we all know that this era, what it has not included, and that's a victory over Ohio State. No one has to tell Jim Harbaugh that either. He knows. The prevailing opinion I hear from our fan base uh, is, if it's not this year, when would it possibly be? And I think at this point, pretty darn fair question, John. Yeah, I think it's a it's a very fair question. When Bo Schembechler came up here in 1969, to to do what he did in that first year to win mm-hmm. to uh, against an invincible Ohio State team just set the tone for the next ten years, the ten year war, and all of that, and all that that followed. It was just he had he was instantly established. Uh, Jim Harbaugh almost had that and felt he did, and I think that's uh, a little of why he. He was uh, he he <laughs> exploded as much as he did after the 2016 game because he thought he had that one and that was you know that was the win that was going to get them to the Big Ten championship game put them in the playoffs all that kind of thing and he's still searching for it now the other thing about it is this is no longer Urban Meyer on the other side and if suddenly Michigan does win this year how much pressure from a, a just a crazy, rabid Ohio State fan base instantly goes on Ryan Day on the other side. <laughs> so there's, a, there's always that uh, turn of the page, and this is a year Michigan really needs to do it. With us on our game day segment this week as we continue the previews, uh, getting ready for the uh, Middle Tennessee State game has been editor John Borton from the Wolverine magazine. 
John, it's always a pleasure, and we don't have to wait long now uh, for opening day or opening kickoff. So as soon as we get the season rolling, we look forward to having you back. Sounds great. We'll know a lot more, but uh, we know plenty now. Thanks, Mike. Quick Hits is next as we wrap it up for another week here on The Michigan Man and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew. On Quick Hits today, no injury updates as we take the show on Tuesday morning, which is always good. Next week, we are done with the months of previews and pondering what could be this season. It's time to tee it up and get this much-anticipated season underway. On Tuesday's Michigan Game Day show, my scheduled guest is beat writer Nick Baumgartner from The Athletic Detroit. On Thursday's Visitors Edition, we are hoping to have Middle Tennessee radio play-by-play voice Chip Walters join us. So make sure you come back next week as we get ready for that big Saturday night opener in the big house. Remember, our free show app is available from the iTunes and Google Play stores. You can also hear us this season on Radio.com, iHeart, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Spotify. That does it for our last preview show of the season. If you're like me, you are tired of speculating and waiting for some Michigan football action. It's almost time. Have a great Wolverine week, everyone. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. Until we meet again, take care, and as always, go blue. Thanks for joining us today on The Michigan Man, here on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V-Sporto Network, and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew. Our listener lines are open 24-7 for your calls at 313-263-4842. That's 313-263-4842. Or email us at themichiganmanpodcast at yahoo.com. That's themichiganmanpodcast at yahoo.com. The Michigan Man Podcast is produced at the studios of Robin Lynn Productions, Allen Park, Michigan, and is not affiliated with the University of Michigan. Go Blue!